know I'm in New York. She's flying out the whistleblower from D.C. I got a secret meeting with her. 21 years, former lead counsel for the World Bank. She turned whistleblower, attorney Karen Hudes. It was just in time. The banksters were falling and in high ranks. And with Karen's help, it seemed like the dots were really connecting. Okay, so uh, Karen, uh, we're here with Karen Hudes. Hudes, am I saying right? Yes, that's K perfect. Karen Hudes, could you give uh, the audience a little background on yourself? Yes, I'm a lawyer and an economist, and I worked in the legal department of the World Bank for 20 years. I did what a lawyer inside a bank is supposed to do, which is when the financial information was getting fiddled, I reported it up the corporate ladder. I went to the audit committee. When that didn't work, I went to the U.S. Treasury Department. When that didn't work, I went to the U.S. Congress. When that didn't work, I went to Ben Bernanke. When that didn't work, I went I to the rest that name. of the world. I know that name. I've heard that name. Yeah. And when that didn't work, I went to the rest of the world. And that's where we are now. We're with the rest of the world. I'm an American, raised in the United States. But when the Vietnam War came and they said, love it or leave it, I said, you've got a real point there. And so I went and studied economics at the University of Amsterdam in Holland. But um, I realized that uh, the United States had to stand strong. So I came back. I went to Yale Law School. Um, I went to a law firm that was doing some business on Wall Street. Um, it turned out that that was the law firm where Wild Bill Donovan, who created the OSS. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know that. That was actually the only job offer I had <laughs> at the end of law school. So I went there, and then after that, I went and worked at the U.S. Export-Import Bank. And then after that, I went to the World Bank, and I was there for 21 years. Um, before I went to the World Bank, uh, there was a Dutch lawyer um, named Aaron Brochus, and he had been the longest-serving general counsel at the World Bank. But he was also there when the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund were created. Uh, and he told me that that organization went to hell in a handbasket when um, Robert McNamara became the president of the World Bank in 1968. That's when things started getting really corrupt. And um, I just did my job as a lawyer. Um, and I started working together with other whistleblowers inside the World Bank. Uh, I went to the U.S. Congress, and that's when Senator Luger wrote three letters to the World Bank saying, don't fire this lady. Um, and of course, they fired me. So I went to Nancy Pelosi, and Nancy Pelosi asked my congressman to get involved. He wrote a letter to the World Bank. Uh, in the meantime, the three senators asked for the U.S. Government Accountability Office to do an audit, Senator Luger, Leahy, and Bai, and the World Bank couldn't be bothered to answer that audit. So I went to the U.K. Serious Fraud Office. They called up the Securities and Exchange Commission. But don't forget, if the Securities and Exchange Commission is in the hip pocket of these banksters, um, they're not going to be bothered to answer the Serious Fraud Office. So um, I then went to the U.K. Parliament together with another World Bank whistleblower. And that was when the power transition model started predicting with 90 to 95 percent likelihood that humanity was going to work together and nip this corruption in the bud. And that's exactly what's going on. We've got a coalition going. By the way, when um, uh, Yasek Kugler is the polit political scientist who came to me in 2004 and told me about this game theory model. And um, at that point, uh, he, went, he, he didn't think we were going to pull it off. Mm -hmm. But he told me, he said, we had five years to prevent a nuclear war in the Middle East. And guess what? That was Syria. We did prevent a nuclear war in the Middle East. Well, the secret is that there is a cover-up of corruption. And John F. Kennedy knew about that corruption, and he solved the problem for the United States. He signed something called the Green Hilton Agreement, Hilton as in Hilton Hotel. Huh. Ten days later, he was dead. And in the meantime, the money that he set aside for the United States, that's sitting there and waiting for us. And the man who has the signature authority over that gold, it's 170,500 metric tons of gold on deposit in the Bank of Hawaii. And uh, it's there for us. All we have to do is accept it. I asked General Dempsey if the United States needed to be strong, then we need a strong dollar. And I asked him how come we had that cloak of secrecy 
over the gold that's intended for the United States. He didn't bother to answer the question. You know, it's always been, you know, who shot Kennedy, you know, the magic bullet and all this, when the real question should be, what was Kennedy doing that but they needed to kill him? Maybe. I'll tell you what Kennedy was doing. He was making sure that when the United States citizens pay their taxes, the money doesn't first go to the city of London and then to the Jesuits in the Vatican. He wanted the money to stay home for the United States citizens so we didn't have to go around hat in hand and pretend like we were poor, when in actual reality, we, together with the rest of the world, are very rich. It's just that the people who thought we were going to be too stupid to work together to find out, uh, they underestimated us. We're going strong. Tell me more, more about Dempsey. Yeah. Well, first of all, there's something called the National Governors Council. And I have been writing to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and to Assistant Secretary Peter Verga. He's the liaison in the Department of Defense with the Homeland Security. And I've been writing to 10 governors on the National Governors Council, mm -hmm. including the co-chair, which is Martin O'Malley. He's the governor of Maryland. That's the state I live in. Okay. And Terry Branstead, he's the other co-chair of the Governor's Council. Mm -hmm. I've been keeping them all up to date. And then uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Dempsey, had a town hall meeting on the 2nd of December. So I asked him a question. I said, if we're talking about military strength for the United States, how can we be a strong country with a weak dollar? Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa are no longer using dollars in their international trade. That's 25 percent of world trade. And uh, so I asked uh, General Dempsey, why is it that we're not accepting the gold that's being offered to the United States? This is gold that John F. Kennedy had set aside for us. He printed out dollars issued by the Treasury Department. That means that we're not paying interest on our debt to the Federal Reserve. Those uncut dollars, they're being um, held secretly. So I asked General Dempsey, why, why aren't we releasing those uncut dollars? They've already been printed. Why aren't we letting the United States stand strong? He didn't bother to answer. I want to know what kind of a chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff wants the United States weak. That's a great question. That's like a magical question, actually. You know, the magical question has always been, uh, you know, who shot Kennedy? And uh, it seems like they, they want us to focus on that. Uh, what are your feelings on I know who killed him. Gambino, when he just got out of jail, he said that the mafia fired the kill shot out of a sewer. They were instructed to do that by the Jesuits. Those are the same people that assassinated Lincoln. And the reason they assassinated Lincoln and the reason they assassinated John F. Kennedy were the same reason, because both of those presidents didn't want the United States citizens' tax dollars to go to the Vatican via the city of London. They wanted the Treasury to issue dollars directly instead of the Federal Reserve notes. And in Lincoln's case, it was a different bank that, was, that we were going to have to pay interest to. That's just a scam. And I think that the proof of that would simply be, you know, what happened after Kennedy was assassinated? Well, things must have been reversed. The, the printing of those dollars must have been halted or reversed, right? Well, they never issued them. They left them uncut. They're waiting to be issued right now. And that's what I asked General Dempsey. So what he put in the, in the, into place, uh, into motion, they killed him to stop it. Because if he would have stayed alive, then he would have continued with issuing the money. That's right. And not only is it those uncut dollars and the gold for the United States citizens, but the Federal Reserve collected gold just before World War II, and they issued bonds in return for the gold. That's $210 trillion worth of bonds, plus all of the compounded interest from the time those bonds were issued. It's now in the quadrillion of dollars. We can use that those promissory notes to offset the U.S. debt. The U.S. gets out of debt this way. So what you're saying is someone is stopping that from happening. Uh, who's, who's the guy that, uh, for the signature? His name is Wolfgang Strzok, and he's the successor in interest to Ferdinand Marcos. 
who set up a collateral trust account which has all the world's gold. It's much more gold than people know about. And diamonds, treasure. As a matter of fact, some paintings in that account came out and were sold by um, Marcus's maid. Mm -hmm. And she, she got convicted of that. And I wrote a letter to her lawyer. I said, those paintings belong to humanity. That was just in the media. I saw that in, in, the, in the primetime media, actually, written about uh, her. Um, so how much was that painting worth? Oh, that was only $34 million, but there, there are three other paintings in the, that was in Voice of America. By the way, I wrote a letter to Voice of America because I've been asking Voice of America why they're covering up the truth to the American people. And the thing about Voice of America is they're supervised by the U.S. Congress. I sent them a copy of the letter I'd written to the U.S. Congress asking them why they're not letting the American public know what's really going on. They're all complicit in this big scam. They want, they want the United States to, um, you know, just become a third-rate nation. We're not ready for that. And what's more, our allies want us strong. They're helping us. That means Russia. That's why I've been on Russia television today three times. I've had an interview in the German um, uh, website, which has 1.5 million business readers per month. And Germany threw a, um, flew a helicopter over the U.S. consulate in Frankfurt. Um, after I did that interview, I said, is there anything I left out? They said, yeah, tell people why it is that uh, the helicopter buzzed the U.S. consulate, broke all the China in the um, consulate. It was because they were trying to get our attention. By the way, Germany has asked for its gold back from the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve refused. And uh, that's an act of war. It's very clear. There's a very accurate political transition model which says the U.S. is at a fork in the road. We can either stand strong and stand by the rule of law, or we can continue our corruption, and there's going to be World War III. And that analysis, that's 90 to 95 percent accurate. And by the way, we're winning because um, there's a U.K. whistleblower named Elaine Colville. Elaine and I got our statement up on the U.K. Parliament website three times. When that happened, the power transition model started predicting with 90 percent likelihood that all of the people on this planet are going to have an end to this corruption. They're going to take back the rule of law. They're going to take back their wealth. And humanity is not going to be um, treated like cattle and their wealth hidden from them by crooks and liars and thieves. Speaking about crooks, liars, and thieves, um, how does this connect or does it connect to Bernie Madoff? Uh, <laughs> it connects very nicely okay. because Bernie Madoff, um, he's, he's running with a pretty fast crowd. Mm -hmm. It's that crowd that wants to um, hold humanity in contempt and hide their real wealth from them. And by the way, there's a very accurate analysis of who that crowd is. Mm -hmm. Three mathematicians at the Federal Institute of Technology took accurate data on who owns all the companies on the capital markets, 43,000 companies. They found out that it's really one band of thieves. They call it a network of control. That group is pulling down 60 percent of the annual earnings of the companies on the stock market, and they own 40% of the assets. Now, not through a lot of money. They have a lot of money, but what they did was they took the same executive directors and they put them on the same boards. That's called interlocking directors. Mm -hmm. And so that group has 10 times the power they're entitled to. And they did it secretly, and they thought we wouldn't find out. Haha, <laughs> we found out. What's the story going around the internet? that uh, one of our states, the United States, was to be nuked. Tell me, have you heard anything about this? Dave, I'm so glad you asked me that because everybody has to know about our two heroes. There's Ma Major General Michael Carey. He's commander of the 20th Air Force, or was, and also Vice Admiral Tim Giardina. These two patriots protected the citizenry. They pre prevented this nuclear device from going off over Charleston, South Carolina. Instead, it went off 600 miles off the coast. And you can tell from the seismograph records 
or for that matter, the cables, the military cables that were intercepted by the Russians. They were planning on creating a false flag event so that they could grab power. That's what they wanted. They wanted us to kiss our republic goodbye. Forget it. Martial law, and they take over all property, which is your home, which is everything. And uh, yeah. I think we want to cover who these culprits are. OK. All right? It's true. The Rothschilds are involved, but they're by far not the most important players. You've got King Juan Carlos. He's the head of the Farnese Continuum, three in one. He's a high-level knight of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem, Sacred Military Constantinian Order of St. George, and he's a Knight of Malta, all rolled into one. And then don't forget the Prince of Naples, Vittorio Emmanuel IV. He tries to claim the title of King of Jerusalem. Um, then, of course, you've got to uh, mention the Palavincinis. And don't forget um, Prince Bernard, of Lita Biesterfeld, and he's married to Beatrix Wilhelmina Armgart, Princess von Oranje Nassau. So there are a lot of players here, and uh, they thought nobody would find out about them, and they thought they would continue the same kind of uh, shenanigans that they've been pulling for centuries. They didn't count on the fact that humanity was onto them, and their game is up. All the whistleblowers in the world are pooling their resources, trying to sort out what's going on. And so one of the whistleblowers is um, a, a Michael O'Bannon. He's um, with a retired military officer, I believe, with the Marines. He wrote a book, and he said that there were uh, two ways for the Jesuits to win. One was for them to remain secret. Guess what? They're not secret anymore. And the other way was for the U.S. military to support the Jesuits. Well, he wrote that the U.S. military, the Russian military, and the Chinese military are all working together, and they are bound and determined that we're not going to have a bankster's World War III this time around. Humanity is right on target to take back our world.